Unfortunately, um, District Attorney Jeff Rosen had a change in his travel schedule and was unable to present today, but uh, we've got an expert here today with us for our program entitled Fraud and Scams, How to Avoid Being a Victim with uh, Santa Clara County Deputy District Attorney Sherry Ballard. Let me start by introducing our guest today. Uh, Sherry Ballard is a deputy district attorney with the County of Santa Clara. She has been a prosecutor for over 36 years. She has prosecuted cases involving narcotics, domestic violence, stalking, workplace violence, rape, auto theft, and career criminals. For the past 16 years, she has been assigned to prosecute financial abuse committed against elders and dependent adults. While assigned to the DA's office elder fraud unit, she's been successful in assisting in the recovery of over $10 million in assets for elder fraud victims. She is a recipient of the Cert Certificate of Appreciation Award from the Victim Support Network of Santa Clara County and the Santa Clara County Employee Excellent Awards, Excellence Award. Together, as a member of the county's financial abuse specialist time, FAST, she was presented an outstanding service award for, from Crime Stoppers. Also, she holds in high esteem two challenge coins she received from her boss, Santa Clara County DA Jeff Rosen, following a successful prosecution and full recovery of money from a banker who stole over $1 million from a very elderly client and in swaying a reluctant bank to reimburse an elderly victim for stolen checks, covering a loss of over $200,000. On a personal level, she loves going to music concerts, traveling to new destinations, and hanging out with her two Basenji, I think that's how you pronounce that, dogs, um, both of which are AKC Grand Champions. Uh, please join me in welcoming Deputy DA Sherry Ballard this morning. Welcome, Sherry. Hello, I'm glad to be here. Um, I was not aware of the Los Altos Community Coalition, so we're always learning. Uh, Jeff does send his apologies. He would be here if he could. Um, he was called out to New York of all places, so I'm happy to be here in his stead. Great, and I mean, thank you for all the work you've done all these years to uh, to help the residents of Santa Clara County and. Um, We'll, uh, we're going to do a little bit of an intro and then we'll, um, uh, Sherry's prepared some slides that we'll go through and uh, walk through with everybody. So um, thank you again for filling in. Um, let's, uh, let's go through um, uh, just one quick thing before we dive in. It, it'd be great if you could just give us an overview on your role in the Santa Clara County DA's office. I talked through a little bit of it, but uh, I'm sure you can do a better job than I did. Sure. So as you know, I'm a prosecutor and I'm assigned to handle only elder and dependent adult financial abuse cases, fraud cases. Therefore, I've had the luxury of being assigned cases vertically instead of handoffs and so forth, which means I'm involved with uh, initially the call-ins that we get, the law enforcement investigation. I get to get involved in their uh, search warrants and seizure warrants and how to interview victims and suspects and so forth. Once their investigation is complete, they would give their investigation packet to me to review, and I'll decide if we have enough evidence to prove the case and determine if we're going to file it with the court. Ultimately, uh, then I will handle the prosecution uh, in the court from arraignment through sentencing. Sentencing includes seizing assets, assisting in the obtaining uh, of restitution for victims, and the recommendation of appropriate sentencing. And then also I'm in, uh, responsible for public outreach regarding elder fraud, and we believe that prevention is the best tool we have in these cases. So again, thank you for having me here. Yeah, great. Well, why don't we um, why don't we dive in? And I'm gonna um, bring up the PowerPoint slides here, and hopefully this will all go smoothly. Uh, here we go. And then uh, just Sherry, just let me know when you want me to uh, to change from one slide to the other. Okay, there we are. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> all right. 
So we have a special crime in the penal code uh, specifically for crimes of elder fraud and dependent adults. I'm just going to use the word elder victims, but dependent adults um, fit as well. Dependent adults are adults that can't really take care of themselves very well. They have mental uh, cognitive difficulties and physical disabilities. Uh, difficulties. Penal Code Section 368D is really our crime of choice in here. And the legislature has seen fit uh, for these kinds of protections of elders uh, 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 from scams and thefts or whatnot, uh, because they agree that elders, as our victims, may be confused. They're on various medications. They're mentally or physically impaired. They're less able to protect themselves. They're unable to understand or report criminal conduct. They can't even obtain their bank records to assist the law enforcement uh, officers. They're unable to competently testify in court. They're less resilient to recover financially. So, so again, we've created a statute particularly for elder financial abuse, and we have our own vertical unit uh, to address these issues. Next slide. Elder frauds become the crime of the 21st uh, century just quickly. By 2030, the number of people aged 65 and older in the U.S. will double to 70 million. California's population of people aged 65 and older will double by 2025. We're almost there. People ages aged 50 and older who can, uh, will control 70% of the nation's household worth, quite the target. In 1900, if you were born, your life expectancy was 47 years. Now, in 2005, if you were born, your life expectancy is 77 years. So our elderly population is growing. Next slide, please. Um, and before I get into the slides, I want to talk to you about the county's uh, financial abuse specialist team. We are a nationwide model uh, for this collaborative team. We call it FAST. It uh, has been for a long time unique to Santa Clara County. It's a collaborative team comprised of the Adult Protective Services, our social workers, the public guardian and administrator. They do conservatorships of um, victims the deputy DA, our DA investigator, county council, and their sheriff investigator. Uh, we talk about the latest uh, breaking cases of an elder uh, that we just learned about is suffering financial abuse. For instance, in a seven-year period, the team prevented the loss and of and recovered over $171 million in assets, and that's just for conservatives alone. Next slide. Um, so I want to get uh, talk about some of the common scams, and these aren't just uh, targeted at the elders. Um, it, it, it's common for everybody. Uh, so I want to just mention, I could go do this for four hours, but I'll <laughs> be really quick and go through these scams. We have the business email compromise, BEC scam. So this involves criminals who have hacked a vendor's or recipient site they send an email message to the victim that appears to come from a known source making a legitimate request. For example, a home buyer receives a message from their title company or who they think is their title company with instructions on how to wire their down payment, which could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. There are slight variations on legitimate email addresses from the scammer sending sender fooling victims into thinking fake accounts are authentic. Example, next page. The slight variations on legitimate email addresses from the sender. You could see John Kelly at Title Company versus John Kelly with the addition of the E. That's something that might go uh, undetected. The scammers are very wise. Also, what I've seen, the most commonly used scam email character is inserting the letter A to per replace the Cyrillic letter A. And this usually comes from foreigners that don't know any better. Um, so look for that kind of stuff. Next slide. Um, another common scam that is still ongoing and it's been going on since I've been doing this. It's an old scam. I've received these calls. My uh, uh, husband's parents have received these calls. It's very common, the, the hello grandma scam. So an elderly victim receives a phone call. The caller claims to be a grandchild or a friend of the grandchild in distress. 
Well, Thomas, that doesn't sound like you. Well, that's because I have a broken nose. Grandpa, I'm, I was vacationing in Mexico and I got in a DUI and I'm in jail now and I need bail money, but don't tell mom and dad, can you send the bail money? So typically it's the grandchild in distress needing money. The elder is told that a friend will pick up the money or is instructed to wire money or to send a prepaid gift card or to mail cash. Often these crimes, these calls come in at two in the morning when the victim's mind is befuddled. They'll drive to an ATM cash machine at two in the morning. Next slide. These are true stories. Um, tech support scam. And I'm sorry, I'm just whizzing through these. No, it's great. Give you Good okay, clip. as much as I can. Okay. So on a tech support scam, we've been seeing more and more of these. I've had them uh, pop up on my laptop and cell phone. The scammer wants you to believe you have a serious problem with your computer or your cell phone, a virus, a Trojan, whatever. They want you to pay for tech support services you don't need. They often ask for payment via, via wiring and gift card, cryptocurrency or money transfer apps because these types of payments are hard to reverse. You can go down to your local Walmart and there's a, I don't know if it's the case anymore, but there used to be cryptocurrency like ATM machines inside the Walmart where you would access this type of money. And I, it's always been so silly to me to pay anybody with a gift card but our elderly people, they do it. They go down to Target. They grab a waft of uh, gift cards and load them up. So the notice is received via, the, the scam notice is received via a pop-up warning on your computer screen or a phone call on your cell phone. Example, next slide. So here's a copy of what a pop-up might look on your screen. You're just doing nothing, nothing, you know, nonchalantly on your computer and boom, you get this warning. Well, just delete it. Don't open it. Ignore it. Go back to your computer and see if anything's wrong, but do not click on any alerts in here. Yeah, go down to Best Buy or the Geek Squad to take care of your computer. Don't deal with somebody on the internet to help you fix uh, your computer. Next slide. <laughs> Uh, this one was probably the hugest uh, scam, and I deal with it probably, I get three or four calls a week. Um, sometimes we're able to help victims of this crime, but others not. They're generated by uh, regular mail, email, phone calls, cell phone calls. They could be international sweepstakes, bogus sweepstakes. Uh, they might use a generic name of the sweepstakes. If you get it by mail or email, you want to look for um, grammar and misspellings that are slightly off. In the mail, it, it, you know, sometimes the letter is crooked on the stationery. It, it, it just flags of it being fake, 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 fake. They ask uh, the victims to pay by way of Western Union, prepaid gift cards. Victims routinely mail cash. They FedEx cash. Or the caller from overseas will send a money mule to the elderly's home to come pick up cash or whatnot. Sometimes we've been able to work closely with law enforcement to set up a sting operation for law enforcement for, to wait for these mules that come to the elderly's home and arrest them there. And then it's our job to prove that these mules knew what they were doing. Something criminal was afoot when they were sent to pick up the money. Next slide. Um, how the advanced fee lottery works, the victim receives a call or email from a person, and usually it's from a person that has two names, like two first names, Jim, jo Jim Jones or George John. Uh, that's a red flag as well. They'll say, you won a $10 million prize in the sweepstakes, but you have to ask yourself, did I ever enter a sweepstake? But first, you must pay taxes or advanced fees on your winnings, and that's the hook. They're asked to send money to another person's bank account. We call that the money mule. And then the money mule will send the money maybe to another money mule and then overseas. When the money goes overseas, oftentimes that money is unrecoverable. Uh, we have successfully extradited and prosecuted domestic money mules. Um, and that's about as far as we can take it. To go further, we need to uh, report to the FBI. Personally, I have yet to see the FBI 
arrest somebody on foreign territory and bring them back to the United States for prosecution. So typically once this money is gone, it is extremely difficult to recover and get the money back. Next slide. Oh, just a sec, there it goes. So Okay. Home services fraud, think of unlicensed contractors or travelers coming through the city. This typically is involved with roofing, driveway paving or seal coating, power washing, painting. Uh, work is offered at bargain prices. Sometimes the elder person or the victim will get a knock on their door. Uh, the person will say, hey, you know, I've got all this stuff left over from another job. I noticed your driveway could uh, used to be retired or reserviced or, or whatever. Typically, they've got bogus or uh, diluted materials on their truck. Um, always wanting a deal and thinking you need the job, you're going to say, well, sure, go ahead. Once the job starts, the suspect commonly extorts uh, for a higher payment than the original quote halfway through the, uh, the work. And they ask for more money and more money and more money. Also, in home services fraud, uh, we prosecute a lot of unlicensed contractors. They engage in very shoddy contracting for home upgrades, um, or they take money up front and never come back. Uh, so we ask that if this is the case, you're dealing with an unlicensed contractor, you report it to the California State Licensing Board, they do their investigation and then present it to the DA's office. Next slide. Ruse entry and utility em, uh, employee imposter home burglary, distraction home burglaries. And this happens uh, a lot with the elderly community and it's really um, a sad situation. And it's usually done by the nomadic predators that will come through the state, stay a couple weeks, move on, move on, move on, and finally out of state. And they're hard to identify as well, but we have had success in prosecuting them. The suspect will knock at the person's uh, door claiming to be with a local utility service, water, gas, power, cable. This contributed to why you now get phone calls from PG&E saying we're going to have a person in your area looking at something because they're worried uh, about these distraction burglars. So you'll get a warning from the utility company. They will tell you they need uh, to come into the home. Um, let's say it's the water company. They come into the home for the purpose of distracting the elder's attention. They will bring the elder to the sink. Hey, could you go under the sink and take this wrench and bang on a pipe while I go blah, blah, blah out back or something to check on the water? Or they're standing by and another criminal associate enters the home and starts rummaging through the back of the house while the elder is banging on the water pipe. Uh, they're very good at finding where you stash and hide money and jewelry. I've had a case where one um, suspect was able to rip a safe that was bolted into the floorboards out of the closet and drag it out into the truck and it was gone. So the theft is typically committed by associates who enter the home. Uh, we usually charge first degree burglary on these types of cases. Okay, next. <laughs> Um, the IRS or you have a warrant scam. I've received these phone calls, typically by phone call. It's a call from an alleged officer with the IRS or the police department. And remember, the IRS will always send taxpayers a written notice by way of U.S. mail. They claim that money is owed for back taxes or that you have an old warrant for your arrest. If you get, you know, an infraction a speeding ticket, when it goes to warrant, you don't show up. That actually turns into a misdemeanor warrant. Uh, so they're trying to fool you and, and scare you into believing that you have a warrant. They're going to threaten to arrest you, come to your workplace or your home. No one's going to do that for a traffic warrant unless payment is made right away, usually directing the victim to get prepaid money or reloadable gift cards, which is a ridiculous way to pay anything to the government. Trust me, it happens all the time, and it, it, it's hard to trace where these go. If you get a reloadable gift card, the crook will call you back to say, what's the control number on your gift card? And they can access the money that way without ever even receiving the cards or meeting you in person. Um, next. So in summary, 
Versions of all these scenarios happened to real victims. I can attest to that. All the messages were fake. And in each case, thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars were instead sent to the criminals. Most of the time, the money, when it's sent overseas, was unrecoverable. Next. How can I protect myself? Trust your instincts. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Verify any caller or emailer using an independent number. Call, call them back, finding the number your own way. Never give out personal information over the phone. It is illegal for a legitimate sweepstakes to require money up front before paying out winnings. Never invest more than you can afford to lose. Verify with the uh, contracting state licensing board if the contractor is licensed. Next. Um, reporting crimes. We'd like you to first report to the local law enforcement agency. If you're having problems with them, you call me. I ask for the report number. I'll call the police department to say, hey, what's up? Can we get an investigation going? Um, on bigger sort of federal or international or, or even national crimes um, or internet crimes, the FBI has a cyber internet crime complaint center. Just Google uh, FBI internet, ic3.gov, and a complaint form will pop up. You can call the district attorney's office if it's for elder. Here's our elder fraud hotline. We typically uh, will investigate, the DA's office will investigate cases when it's complex fraud or real estate or something is just hot off the burner and maybe we can seize money right now to get it back. Uh, for contracting issues, please report to the CSLB. And I encourage you, if you suspect financial abuse of anybody, you can call the County Adult Protective Services. If you don't want to say who you are, you can do it confidentially. They will tend to send their uh, social workers out to the elder's home to do a checkup. They're not looking to take away their rights. They're not looking to refer it to the public guardian's office for conservatorship. That's the least onerous means they will take but they can at least get out there to see if there's other services your neighbor, grandfather, great uncle might need. Um, next. I think that was it. Um, okay, that's it. <laughs> can, can I ask a follow-up while this slide is still up? So um, is, is there, you know, do you start with local police and if that goes nowhere, you move on or how, how do you decide which one of these to start with if you have a situation? So if it's not quite a crime, but you think a crime is going to occur, and we're talking about elders, call Adult Protective Services, and they can launch their social workers on there and see what's going on. And if the social workers dig a little bit deeper, they might find a crime, and then they are mandated reporters to law enforcement who will do the criminal investigation. Um, but we ask that you start with local if you believe a crime has occurred or is occurring, then we ask that you start with local law enforcement agency. A lot of times these calls end up with me, but we have 13 or 14 agencies <laughs> and I can't take all of them. Um, we have one dedicated elder fraud DA investigator and then we have several real estate uh, fraud investigators. We have a grant, so we handle uh, all of the real estate fraud investigation, elder or not, in this county at the DA's office. Okay, great. Uh, let me switch back over here to uh, to the Zoom window. Can, we Everybody can see that, right? Just nod your heads if you're... Okay, great. Just making sure our AV is working. Um, well, th thank you so much, Sherry. That was, that was super helpful. Um, I know uh, I just went through a situation this week where um, we switched cellular providers and they said, if you want to opt out of marketing from us, call this number. And it was this thing, optoutprescreen.com, which at first looks a little scammy. And I was very hesitant to, you know, give them my social security number and other information. Um, but I, I did a little bit of digging around to make sure it looked legit before I had my entire family, you know, load up the information uh, for these credit agencies. But, um, uh, you know, we're, we've all seen these or been victim to them in the past and uh you know super helpful to know what sorts of things we should be doing so uh so thank you for that um so just a few questions before we switch over to um to the audience questions um 
I'm curious if you have a sense of, you know, how much these fraud and scams um, have been growing in the last few decades. Like, is, has it just skyrocketed or are we kind of reaching steady state? I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Well, okay. So I've been doing elder fraud for what, 16 years, so almost two decades. Uh, and so I can tell you from what I've seen, I can't say that I've seen more cases because cases are reported in so many different ways to so many different agencies. And I don't have like the local agencies um, statistics. Of course, we wouldn't deal uh, with state cases or federal cases. Um, but the trend that I have seen is that everything is moving to cyber, cyber crimes, which of course are much harder to detect than your typical home burglary uh, or, or street crime. Um, uh, so most of it is online scams. We didn't really talk about online dating and online romance scams, but that's a big one. Uh, that's been uh, increasing since more and more elders are on getting online, getting on the internet, and braving the online dating scheme. You know, with the online dating, I, I would just say if you've never met this person in person, personally greeted them, don't give them money because most likely you're being scammed. Even if you feel like you've done your due diligence and you've got the love bug going on you, never give these persons money especially if you haven't met them in person. But to get back to your question, it's it's hard to um, answer. Like I said, more, more crimes are going uh, online and it's harder for the officers um, to investigate. And also I will say this, um, our laws have been diluted probably the past 10 years where we don't have cash bail. It's harder for us to put criminals in jail. And as a result of that, uh, street crimes, property crimes have exploded. And so if a cop, you know, instead of investigating 50 cases, now has 500 cases, it's really difficult for them to have any investigation come to a head. So uh, the squeeze has really been on our police departments. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, that's, that's helpful. Um, so uh, given you know, that this has been going on and, and growing, um, what, what are law enforcement or the DA's office doing to, um, you know, try and prevent this upfront, you know, events like this, where we're spreading the word a little bit, what, what other things do you do to uh, help out with, with prevention? Well, you hit the nail on the head with, um, seminars like this, um, both law enforcement agencies and the DA's office, we go out quite a bit, uh, to do um, uh, this kind of outreach. We go to senior centers a lot, uh, as well as other clubs such as Rotary and Kiwanis and so forth, because we want the kids and families and friends to be aware of what might be going on with their elderly uh, neighbor or, or whatever. So we need them to do the checkup. Our office also likes to do a lot of press releases on cases, not just to find more victims on a particular crime, but to notify the public of what's going on out there and what we arrested this guy for. Uh, so be careful, particularly with, with bankers that steal uh, from their own clients. So outreach uh, is big. Great. And um, this example came up in one of our discussions where, um, you know, there were some on-site uh, services like a window cleaner, and they left the windows unlocked so that they can come back later and break in. Um, any advice on how homeowners might be able to uh, protect themselves in that situation? Just again, so I haven't heard of this burglary. I'm hearing it for the first time from you. Um, it, it kind of reminds me of the ruse burglars that we talked about, but diligence is key. But if you have an elder who's starting to have dementia and, and isn't really paying attention, I could see this happen, happening quite easily. Um, these kind of window cleaners are probably the kind of people that knock on the door. Hey, we're in the area. You want us to clean your windows? We did it with neighbor Joe, and that might be the case. But now if you're the elder, you're going to be the target of their scam. All I can say is use Due diligence, um, uh, 
call a reputable company, maybe the older, we don't have the yellow pages anymore, if they can get on Google, ask a family member to help you uh, call an agency and of course check your windows when you're done. This reminds me of another scam that the nomadic predators do. A mom and child might come knock on a person's door or say, hi, we're thirsty, can we use your bathroom? Well, okay, come on in. And while the mom's in the bathroom, the child's gonna go to the back of the house rooting for anything they can find. Um, you know, a lot of times I don't answer my door. I don't leave my screen door open. Keep your doors locked and you don't have to answer your door. Ring doorbell's been nice because you can see who's there and decide if you even want to answer it. So those are my uh, precautions. All right. And then um, my last question for you before we go to the audience. So get get your questions ready, everybody. Um you know, with with the advances in artificial intelligence, um, we've seen that a person's voice or their image or their video can be cloned, essentially. And uh, what are the implications uh, of this, of these trends on fraud and scams? Like, have you have you seen any of these and have you prosecuted yet? I have not seen it. I have not prosecuted it again. I'm an elder fraud. Um, uh, our other high tech company might have seen them and prosecuted them. But from what I know, there's like eight artificial intelligent companies out there called You Only Virtual. So they create chat box. So if you're grieving over a lost one, you'll see grandma up on your computer screen having a conversation with you. And to me, that's very creepy. I don't see how that would help anybody's grief, but you know, to each their own. Um, it reminds me of the fortune telling scams. Uh, we're going to ward off evil spirits or let's contact the spirits out there. I see this kind of situation for the true believers. Um, the fortune telling scams have duped many people out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And these are victims usually dealing with issues of love, money issues, grief, like in these AI chatbot conversations. So it touches on the true believer syndrome maybe those with a little bit of onset dementia, not really thinking straight. They want the fortune teller to use the spirits to reach out to the person that dumped them to try to convince them to get back together. But once they're on the hook, they'll be giving these fortune tellers more and more and more money, more and more money. Um, and, and so it's scamful to me. Um, I would just say friends and community members keep a watchful eye on your grandmother, your great aunt, your neighbor. Um, not necessarily a crime yet, but once they get your hooks into you, they'll be asking for more and more money. Those are my thoughts on that. Okay, great. And uh, any closing thoughts before we go over to the audience? Um, yes. Uh, if you know, if you've become a victim or know somebody, first thing to do, call the bank immediately to try to get charges reversed. You might have a two or three day window to get that happen. Um, if checks are the scam, make sure fraud complaints are filed with the bank immediately. After 30 days, they're just going to blow you off and they're not going to reimburse you for fake charges. So first step is your bank. Um, family members, get involved. Uh, obtain power of attorneys. See if you can have access to your elderly um uh, victims' accounts. Sometimes powers of attorney, though, could be powers of abuse, and it gives bad people access to the accounts. But for the good people, keep an, a watchful eye. Report any suspected of financial abuse to APS and take it from uh, there and call lo local law enforcement. You've got the DA elder fraud hotline. All right. Well, let's uh, let me switch over to gallery view here. And um... Um, thank you so much for for the uh, the conversation, Sherry. And um, if you raise your virtual hand, uh, we'll uh, we'll get started on the questions. I'll call on you. Um, just remember one question per person and uh, no speeches, please. And uh, Gary has his hand raised. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, thank you for all of that. Very helpful. What if your elder doesn't live in Santa Clara County? Uh, if let's say they live in Contra Costa County, then you would call Contra Costa County APS. So APS is involved where the elder resides. 
and it's where the crime occurs is what police department you would call. And we have relatives from Canada that can't help grandma. And a lot of times that's where the public guardian's office will come in to consider a conservatorship if they don't think the close family members are capable of doing it themselves. Thank you. Uh, Larry. Hi, first of all, thank you for the, the very helpful talk. This is important work you're doing and we appreciate it. Um, one of the things that's striking about this is, is that you know, the prime mover and a lot of the cyber stuff can well be far, far away from any sort of jurisdiction to the point where, you know, they could tell you their real name and it wouldn't matter because the local people aren't going to do anything about it. Do you know of any efforts to make kind of international uh, cooperation happen to try to tamp that down? Because, you know, obviously if somebody tries to rob your house, they're there, you call the police, it's all in jurisdiction, but the cross jurisdictional issues with this just seem like a nightmare. So I've seen, uh, we've had elder abuse task force. We've got the FBI uh, task force. Um, we have coalitions with Canada and Jamaica, and uh, they might do an investigation. Uh, the most successful agency I've used for these international scammers has been the U.S. Postal Service. They would only get involved, though, if we're dealing with uh, items that were mailed. But Larry, you're you're right. It's difficult to reach out overseas to get that scammer in the internet, uh, the internet uh, uh, cafe in in Nigeria, uh, Jamaica call centers. Um, I'm not happy with. <laughs> the lack of the Fed's uh, ability to bring those people uh, back to the United States for us to prosecute. That's about all I can say. We have, um, you know, we collaborate occasionally with FBI when we have a victim who loses over a million dollars. Sometimes the FBI will take the case. Sometimes they, they won't. Um, typically, there's a huge web of money mules in the United States, um, and it just gets overwhelming for the feds to go after every single little money mule in the different states. Um, it is a big problem, and I hear the pain. Thank you. We, we, try to, we try to do the best we can at the local level, and again, our officers can write search warrants for money that has gone into a New York bank. Sometimes we've got to get the New York cops to write a search warrant to help us. And you could see the delay that it's going to occur. But once we've established that this money mule knew what he was doing was wrong, um, we'll try to seize the money from his bank accounts and bring them back to our county since the crime occurred here uh, and deal with them there. Actually, um, Sherry, I don't know if you're familiar with Mark Rober, who's a famous YouTuber. Uh, he actually lives here in Sunnyvale in the Bay Area, and he has uh, he's always focused on science related things. But he actually did a program um, where he found some of these mules and actually recorded them and and brought some of the the uh, recordings to, you know, the the officials who could go pursue that. So uh, might might be worth reaching out to him at some point since he's local and he lives in Santa Clara County. Uh, I think they've developed a number of tools that uh, uh, that they use in those cases, and they they turn them into videos. But uh, you know, might be useful in other areas. Uh, I will say prob probably our DA, Aaron West, who's on the high tech unit, and we do have a, a cyber high tech unit at the DA's office. I would bet you they are aware, you know, okay. I'm just dealing with the elders. But yes, thank you for that. Yeah, no, it's it was really it's a great video for those of you who haven't seen it. Just uh, look up Mark Rober on uh, YouTube and you'll see all of his videos, including his uh, uh, packages he leaves on the porch for porch pirates and uh it it uh it's, it's a called a glitter bomb that goes <laughs> off in their house when they uh when they get there. Um, Adine has a question. I have so many questions, and <laughs> some of them are just triggered stay, by you. Stay focused right on the topic today, Adine. Okay, not you know I was, I was the larger to world next. Yeah, I was getting to squirrels next. Um, I actually I have three questions, but I'm on monopolized. So I'll ask them sort of the most pressing one, I think, which is. Um, when we're talking about elder care and elder support and um, having personally experienced this just now, 
with an R and then passed it with one of our parents. Um, do the criminals actually sort of use public information around death notices? Yes, um, they do. A, when you when you I did my mother's on that? They do. Yeah. When I did my mother's own obituary, I didn't put her birth date in there. I only put the year that she was um, that she passed away and her age, but I didn't put when she was born. And I was very careful to uh, how I announced um, her children. Um, I probably used my married name rather than the name that I use publicly. Um, but that is a big problem. Um, Crooks do uh, feed off obituaries, so be careful what you post in it. Thank you. I have more questions, Joe, but again, I don't want to go, go, go ahead, take one more, and then I think right. uh, Kim has a question as well. He he might ask afterwards. Go go ahead, Adine. So, so this is this is related to this subject. I mean, obviously, we have uh, an important conversation. It affects a, a segment of our population, and yet I'm looking at the number of people who even attended this session. And, and I, I wonder how better do we actually educate members of our community about how to be careful um, and how they can protect themselves, especially when you're dealing with, I mean, in my circumstances, my parents do not live near me. Uh, there is no way I'm gonna pop over to their house and fix a co computer issue and things along those lines, but we, we don't seem to have enough attention or energy around this issue. And I'm just wondering what other strategies the DA's office might be looking at. Well, in addition to us doing public presentations and you know that could be two or three times a week, our budget only allows one DA on the unit. And so we get busy. Of course, our priority is prosecution in the courts, but we do have other people working in our consumer protection unit that go out and do uh, resource fairs the law enforcement officers in their fraud units, they go out and attend resource fairs. But you're right, education, um, you, we just got to keep doing it and doing it. And anybody who calls our office to come out for some outreach, we respond, yes, we'll be there, we'll do it. Um, we'll find a way to have it done. That uh, and I and like I said, we do press releases on some important cases that we think the public needs to know about. Um, yeah, that's that's about all I can uh, recommend. <clears throat> all right, we've got um, two more questions, and then we're gonna wrap up so we can get Sherry out of here by nine thirty. Uh, Kim, go ahead. Hi, uh, uh, thank you very much for the informative presentation, Sherry, and, and, and all the work you're doing. It's really excellent. A question I have is I heard or read recently, I can't remember the source, that some of the robocalls you receive are actually uh, just seeking to get a sample of your voice so they can clone it for purposes of defrauding people. Is that really a thing? And, and yes. is there a good way to get the word out about that? Because I think you know, I used to, you know, it's hello, and but I, you know, I've realized if I'm answering and saying anything, I may be giving a sample, so I should just say nothing. So when I answer a call that I don't recognize, you know, because I'm maybe buying a house and so weird calls are going to be calling me to, to get the thing through. A lot of times I don't like answering uh, unknown calls, but sometimes you just have to. All I'll do is say hello. My husband will be yelling in the background, don't say yes, don't say yes, <laughs> you know? So it's just, hello. Big silence, and then they hang up because they're not getting anything from you. And then you go and block those calls. But yes, they're starting to use your voice samples um, for authority. That's part of our outreach and so forth. Um, our office did prepare an elder fraud uh, pamphlet and I could send some to you, but those types of scams are mentioned on our pamphlets. We distribute at our, uh, our, our outreach. We've got these uh, in our office and so forth on, you know, don't answer the phone if you don't recognize the number, but that's, that's hard to do. But yes, the robocallers are using your voices to set up other scams. Our high tech unit can probably talk more about that. Uh, again, it boils down to how do we identify the perpetrator so we could bring them into court to prosecute them. Thank you. All right. And last question, uh, Gary. Hello again. Um, following up on uh, Adine and the education side of things, 
How about make it something that's kind of intriguing to people, uh, perhaps uh, posting on your website or somewhere, scam of the week. And so some of the things that are currently happening right now, so people would be intrigued and have to go to that and learn, and then it could link to the uh, Fraud Abuse website, yeah, which I just looked at your page and, and I don't see anything quite like that, but something that's pretty jazzy, gets, draws some interest. I think Scam of the Week would do it. I, I think that's an excellent idea. I have not um, visited our website lately, but I know that in the past we have, with Jeff Rosen, created um, a lot of videos to, to click on. And I apologize if you weren't able to find those links. I'll talk to our webmaster to say, hey, where are those links? We talk about gypsy, or I'm sorry, uh, fortune telling scams. Uh, we, we, we have... <laughs> We have done that. Um, so let me see if we can get those links back up on our website. Scam of the week is a great idea. Um, and so I will talk to Mr. Rosen about that. Yeah, it could be uh, something even the town crier publishes and gets syndicated out to the local newspapers. So that could be cool. Um, uh, all right. Well, um, thank you, uh, Sherry. Um, just a few announcements and then we'll close. Our next meeting is on Friday, November 3rd from 8.30 to 9.30, as always. Uh, please join us for a discussion entitled uh, Lessons Learned from Taxi Driver and Eleanor Rigby, Isolation, Loneliness, and Risks to Civil Society and Democracy. Try saying that twice. Um, with Annabelle Pelham, uh, Executive Director of the Center for Age-Friendly Excellence Cafe. Uh, if you'd like to be added to our mailing list, please send an email to info at losaltoscommunitycoalition.org. Uh, the email is posted in the chat. And a um, uh, big thank you as always to the Los Altos Mountain View Community Foundation for providing LACC with financial and in-kind support. Thank you, Adeen. Uh, so Sherry, thanks once again, and um, we'll look forward to seeing everybody in a few weeks. Thank you.